Well, good day. My job is to make intelligent noises. Your job is to copy the first heading down and underline it. We will begin our study of element theory with a Greek tragedy. Socrates lived in Athens at a time when it was threatened by the hoplite warriors of Sparta. He lived for 71 years and fought bravely in three wars. But he is best remembered as a philosopher who encouraged his students to ask questions about all sorts of things. Lessons were a dialogue where students proposed alternative solutions to problems and debated them. Such attitudes can be dangerous in rigid and authoritarian systems. Socrates fell foul of the leadership, was tried by 600 citizens in an early act of democracy and sentenced to a painful slow death by drinking the poison hemlock. In this painting you can see his students and the executioner. Socrates seems to have believed in an afterlife and that his ideas would survive. They did. By a process of continuous debate, science was encouraged to move forward and to discover new insights. After the conquest of much of the ancient world by the young warlord Alexander, some philosophers established academies and tutored the sons of the aristocracy. They are credited with the invention of the old classical element theory. Please copy that down as a side heading. The word element is an English word. The Greek word for element was stoichia and was first used by Plato in one of his plays around 360 BC. It literally meant the letters in a word. Just as words are made of letters, the universe is made of elements. Aristotle extended the idea further. The universe is made of simple things called elements. Elements can't be divided into simpler elements. These are modern definitions and should be written down. Let us look at Aristotle's element theory in its modern context. Good old mate Aris used to be a living human. 
like us he was made of protein, which contains the modern elements that have symbols C, H, O, N, P and S. Test your knowledge. See if you can list in a column the names of those six famous elements of life. Answers are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Were you right? What do you think about that, Arasal, mate? Any talent there? Whoops. We have just seen that there are at least six elements in human bodies. They are the simple things from which we are made. This chemical is one of them. We call it sulphur. It is mentioned in the Old Testament under its old name brimstone, meaning a rock which burns. You cannot take sulphur and split it up into anything simpler using heat or electricity or whatever. However, you can combine sulphur with other elements to make compounds. If we burn sulphur, it combines with oxygen forming the compound sulphur dioxide. And human noses don't like that stuff. It can cause asthma and kill if there is enough of it. Volcanoes emit heaps of the foul chemical. In nature, the element sulphur combines with many metals. Pyrite, or fool's gold, is iron sulphide. Bornite, or peacock ore, is copper iron sulphide. And galena is lead sulphide. But we are getting ahead of ourselves. We really need to talk about the classical element theory that most ancient cultures embraced. We will see that that model had big problems. The ancient scholars looked around for the building blocks of the universe and came up with the same four elements. See if you can complete this from the clues. So the classical elements for most ancient cultures were air, earth, fire and water. But hey, we seem to have another one. The ancient philosophers considered that there may be a fifth element, very different from the others. The down-to-earth Romans called it the Quinta Essentia, meaning fifth element. Oh, duh. The Asians were attracted to the idea of empty space, or void. The Greeks looked up at their blue skies and imagined it to be above the earth, the clean air of the gods. They called it the ether. You may encounter this word again if you are very smart and study relativity theory. The ether was heavenly, 
with a power of life and outside the material world. Could it be that the fifth element was ideas and perhaps thought itself? My Norse ancestors thought that it was the lightning that hit the sacred trees that they worshipped. They were the people who invented Thor's day after their god of lightning. It is the nature of human philosophers to take some ideas too far. Plato considered the five elements of the universe to have the form of polyhedra, which are beautiful objects with equal sides. He had absolutely no evidence for his hypothesis. But let us look at some of his element shapes. For air, he chose an octahedron. For earth, a cube. For fire, a tetrahedron. For water, an icosahedron. And finally for ether, a dodecahedron. The primitive classical element theory is still with us. In fact, it may even be making a comeback. In astrology, people are classified into air, earth, water and fire signs, with its practitioners trying to tell us our strengths, problems, who we are incompatible with and what is going to happen to us today. Then there are the card games that have links with the four element theory. The scary tarot cards come in four suits, as do modern playing cards. But the worst effect of the classical element theory was on medicine. As we shall see, it held back progress in that science for centuries and killed people. There is no more important branch of science than that of medicine, and the best scientists become doctors. The healing arts have been practiced in all cultures since the dawn of mankind. But it is interesting to visit the medicine practiced by two brilliant Greek doctors whose ideas were well ahead of their time. The first was Hippocrates, who was born in 460 BC on the Greek island of Kos. He came from a line of doctors and trained at this centre called Asclepion. He lived for 90 years and established his own famous hospital where he researched diseases and trained his followers to be caring physicians. He was a kind doctor who took detailed medical histories and encouraged healing by keeping wounds sterile and clean and used a range of medicines with restraint. This traction device was used to line up broken bones, allowing them to heal. He is most famous for the Hippocratic Oath, where doctors swear to care for their patients. He is also credited with the discovery of the modern drug aspirin, which came from a tree bark. Our second Greek doctor, Galen, was born in the city of Pergamon, which is now part of Turkey. It was a Greek city under Roman rule. He was a brilliant surgeon with very steady hands and successfully attempted brain and eye operations that only now are routine. He dissected many animals in order to study anatomy and published over 600 texts presenting his conclusions. His favourite animal for dissection was the Barbary macaque. His patients included gladiators and Roman emperors. His anatomical diagrams and theories became standard works throughout the Western and Arab world for over 1500 years. During the Dark Ages, the cleanliness and baths practiced by the Romans and Greeks was replaced by squalor and stink. People lived on top of their animals as they do in some countries today. Terrible epidemic diseases evolved and jumped from suffering animals to humans, causing the great plagues of history. Unfortunately, the Greek element theory had a profound influence on Galen's medicine. It was a theory of humours. The four elements, air, earth, fire and water, were linked to the four body fluids, blood, 
black ball, yellow ball, and phlegm. If any of these elements or humours were out of balance, then we were observed to be in bad humour. Sanguine, melancholic, choleric, or phlegmatic. To treat these conditions, medicines could be used to cause vomiting for biles and to bring up phlegm. But the most common treatment was bleeding, which as late as the 18th century was done by barber surgeons. The death of America's first president and founding father is of interest. A big, raw-boned militia officer from Virginia, George Washington led the American Revolutionary Army to victory against the British. At the age of 68, he caught a throat infection whilst riding in the snow at his plantation at Mount Vernon. He was having trouble breathing and the doctors arrived. The scarificator was produced. In a 10 hour period, three and three quarter litres of blood was removed from the president out of a total volume of seven litres. Before the end, he went quiet. This is not surprising. The year was 1799 and these methods continued well into the 19th century. Little wonder that ordinary people often viewed doctors as quacks. Before we leave the ancient Greeks, it is essential that we record another of their more powerful insights. So copy down this second side heading. The Greek adjective atomos means uncuttable. A number of philosophers taught that the universe was made of small particles called atoms that could not be cut into simpler particles. These philosophers included Leucippus, who lived in the 5th century BC, and his more famous pupil Democritus. Their idea was that the world consisted of indestructible particles sitting in a vacuum or void. The view was opposed by most others who thought that matter could be cut up indefinitely. But the atomic idea survived and eventually became its 19th century form. Atoms consist of indestructible spheres. And that is worth writing down. Our modern element theory took about 2,000 years to create and there were many people who made significant contributions. We will visit some of these by creating a table. Draw up two columns. The first will have as a heading My Hero and the second Contribution. Make the table big, the width of your page and include the heading at the top.
any history of element theory should really begin with the metal workers. Their discoveries and traditions began long before writing was invented. They were the hard practical men who dug the metals and metal ore compounds from the mine shafts, who invented bellows to make hot fires, to make the charcoal for the furnace, and to cast metal into shapes. They used crucibles, reheated metal on charcoal braziers, and pounded the hot malleable metal into shapes on their anvils. So make a heading metalsmiths on the top left hand side of your table. In the second column you will write what they did. They discovered a number of common metal elements. Now we will go through a list of some of the metals that they extracted. As you see a metal, write its name and formula in the second column. The first metal is copper Cu. It is first recorded in Iraq around 8700 BC. They probably found native copper nuggets, heated them up and pounded them into shape. All metals are malleable. By 5000 BC, they were smelting copper using charcoal from its ores such as malachite. Next came tin, SN. This was alloyed with copper to make a harder metal called bronze, which found many uses such as ploughs, weapons and armour. The Bronze Age started in 4000 BC. Iron, Fe, was next. With charcoal and pounding, it could be made harder than bronze. The Iron Age replaced the Bronze Age around 1400 BC. Gold, Au, was used from 2600 BC. It usually ended up in the hands of the head psychopaths. Silver, AG, dated from 4000 BC. It was used for coin and plate. Lead, PB, was poisonous, but very easy to melt. Being very easy to bend, it was used extensively by the Romans for plumbing and water pipes in general. Enter our next hero, Abu Musa Jabir ibn Hayyan. The people of the West gave him the Latin name Giba, and you can write that down in your first column. Born in Khorasan in Iran, Giba is credited with being the first of the great experimental chemists. He and his followers invented equipment for crystallising chemicals from their solutions and distilling off vapours or spirits from liquids and solids. They discovered a host of chemicals and techniques never known before. For instance, Common salt is sodium chloride NaCl. By distilling it with sulfuric acid, spirits of salts was formed in the collecting flask. With water, we know this as hydrochloric acid HCl. 
By replacing the common salt with saltpetre or potassium nitrate, spirits of nitre was obtained, which forms nitric acid with water. Citric acid crystals were obtained by crystallising lemon juice. Acetic acid was purified from vinegar. Wine residues were crystallised to crude tartaric acid and then to pure white tartaric acid. Geber also made alkalis and invented the word. To Geber, there are only three elements. Metals which were malleable, non-metal earths, which were brittle, and spirits or gases, which were liberated when chemicals are heated. So fill in the second column of your table. So what happened next? Geber's books were written in a code specifically designed to confuse anyone but his followers. It certainly did that. The word got out that he could make gold using a chemical called the Philosopher's Stone. And that triggered much interest in a new chemical cult called alchemy. It lasted for a thousand years. It was a weird, wonderful and scary mixture of smells, the occult, astrology and mad scientists that would do a Hollywood horror movie proud. In the end, wiser heads pronounced Goeber's writings as gibberish and alchemy was banned, although some scientists such as Newton continued to experiment in secret. The problem was that good experimentation was essential to the progress of science and the old element theory needed challenging. Robert Boyle in his book The Skeptical Chemist promoted the view that there were more elements and that we should be distinguishing between pure substances and mixtures and analysing their ingredients. Boyle's treatise on chemical analysis led to the isolation and discovery of a number of non-metal elements. Henning Brent, an alchemist from Hamburg, discovered phosphorus. The shy Henry Cavendish of the British Royal Society, hydrogen. Scotsman Daniel Rutherford isolated nitrogen. Joseph Priestley from Leeds discovered oxygen. And finally the German Carl Wilhelm Scheele discovered chlorine. Write down the name of our next chemical hero, John Dalton. John Dalton was born into a modest Quaker family in County Cumbria, England. The Quakers were religious dissenters dating back to the English Civil War. They had no clergy but often dedicated themselves to causes such as pacifism, natural living and prison reform. The few surviving modern Quakers are still prominent in organisations such as Greenpeace, Oxfam and Amnesty International. Dalton's career began teaching students in a barn at the age of 12. With his brother, he taught at a well-equipped Quaker school at the village of Kendall and was tutored by blind John Goff. Moving to Manchester, he taught at the Unitarian New College and joined the Manchester Philosophical Society. 
Eventually he resigned and dedicated his life to simple tutoring, lecturing and chemical research. His greatest work was his publication of a volume called A New System of Chemical Philosophy in 1808. For this he is known as the father of modern chemistry. It revolutionised the science by presenting a simple and powerful element theory. You can copy down his main points in your second column. At Dalton's funeral in Manchester in 1844, the procession numbered 100 carriages. Shops closed for the day and 40,000 citizens trooped past his body laid out in the town hall in Quaker Grey. There is still respect today for humility and those who serve. For the first time, scientists were picturing chemicals as atoms and molecules and the hunt was on to find new elements and to discover compound formulas. Swedish chemist Johns Vesalius changed Dalton's old world symbols into simple letters and discovered a gaggle of elements. Scotsman William Ramsey isolated five inert gases and finally the man from Siberia, Dmitry Mendeleev, was attempting to place the known elements into a table of eight columns. The final advance in element theory came from studies of the atom. So put this heading down. Two British laboratories were the nerve centres of breakthrough research into the nature of atoms. They were the Cambridge Cavendish Laboratory and the Manchester Laboratory. Joseph John Thompson led the way by becoming interested in the glowing rays produced in high voltage vacuum tubes such as this one. He was able to prove that they were streams of negative particles with masses smaller than atoms. He had discovered electrons. His first model of the atom pictured a positive pudding containing a number of electron plums. JJ's plum pudding model of the atom may have appealed to the great and good of Cambridge, but it was wrong, as the new rugby-playing Rutherford would prove. But the world-shaking importance of Thomson's research was simple, and you can write it down in your second column. Element atoms contain negative electrons.
Meanwhile in France in 1896, Henri Becquerel discovered radioactivity when he found that a glowing sample of uranium salts could darken a photographic plate. Murray and Pierre Curie followed up on this in 1898 by isolating two radioactive elements, radium and polonium, by reacting uranium ore in an old tin shed. By that time, a brilliant young researcher from the South Island of New Zealand was furiously studying radioactivity with Thompson's group. He concluded that radioactive elements were spitting out two types of small particles that he called alpha and beta rays. The elements were changing into new elements. By the time of his Nobel Prize in 1908, he had worked out that alpha particles turned into helium. Here we see alpha particles leaving tracks in a vapour of cold alcohol. At the end of each track, they become normal helium gas. We now know that alpha particles are helium nuclei, with two positive protons and two neutral neutrons. They are very useful things to use as bullets for studying the properties of atoms. Rutherford's biggest discovery came in 1909. He was then Professor of Physics at Manchester University and his assistant was Hans Geiger. Geiger was a tireless German researcher who spent most of his career inventing better instruments for detecting radioactivity. Also in the department was Ernest Marsden, a smart scholarship boy with a poor background like Rutherford who was completing his honours degree. It was suggested that Marsden's project would be to see what happened when alpha particles hit thin gold foil. The equipment was quite small and is shown in the diagram. The radioactive source was a small piece of radium which spat out alpha particles. Marsden had to sit for long periods in the dark to develop night vision, then peer down a microscope to count faint flashes as each alpha particle hit a zinc sulphide screen. He needed a break after each minute, and the total data amounted to hundreds of thousands of flashes as the telescope was rotated around the equipment. As the data accumulated, Geiger and Rutherford were fascinated and excited. Something highly unexpected was happening, and this is what good scientists long for. Let us look at some of Marsden's data. Remember you are firing big bullets, quite fast, at atoms that should look like a bunch of big bowling balls. You would expect a fair range of deflections, but nothing coming back. The first thing that Rutherford noticed was that most particles were getting through with little deflection. The five degree number was way too big. He had a big think and you can write down his first inference in the second column. The second and more alarming thing was that some particles were actually bouncing off the target. The maths was amazing. Said Rutherford, It was quite the most incredible event that ever happened to me in my life. It was as if you fired a 15 inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. The inference was that a tiny concentrated positive atomic nucleus was repelling and deflecting the alphas through quite high angles. So write that powerful conclusion down too.
So how do we picture Rutherford's element atoms? Atoms are tiny at about one ten billionth of a metre wide. And they are mostly empty space, except for a few tiny electrons plus the nucleus. Yet the nucleus is only one one hundred thousandth the diameter of the atom. If your room was an atom, the nucleus would be the size of a pinhead. We are just all big bags of wind. The final story concerns another young member of Rutherford's group. Henry Mosley was a brilliant scholarship boy who became a lecturer and researcher at Manchester in 1910. He chose to build on the work of father and son South Australian researchers, Sir William Lawrence Bragg and Sir William Henry Bragg. They had pioneered a method of crystal analysis called X-ray diffraction. By passing X-rays through crystals, they form patterns on films that could be used to locate precisely the positions of atoms in the crystal. Mosley applied the technique to produce photographic X-ray plates for ten successive elements in Mendeleev's crude periodic table. He was able to draw quite simple graphs relating the X-ray frequencies to the element positions. He soon realised that each element had its own special number of protons. He was able to redraw the periodic table in its modern form. There were 92 possible elements and he pointed out all the gaps where unknown elements should be. He was the young creator of the modern periodic table of the elements. So write this down in your second column. In 1914, the first of 11 million pointy-hatted goose steppers invaded Belgium and spread misery by killing and robbing civilians and setting up labour camps. The Rutherford team was dispersed by the war. Hence Geiger had returned to Germany in 1912 and was conscripted as an artillery officer. Life in those miserable trenches badly affected his health and killed or injured seven million of his comrades. After the war he perfected his Geiger counter and became professor at Berlin University. As the Nazis came to power, most of his Jewish colleagues fled to the West. They brought with them the news of the German ability to make a devastating bomb. Baron Ernest Rutherford of Nelson is generally regarded as the father of nuclear physics. He spent his war working on U-boat detection using sonar. In 1919 he headed the Cavendish Laboratory and worked on particle bombardment. He was president of the Royal Society and helped many refugee scientists find new positions. His student Chadwick discovered the neutron and Cape Croft and Walton split the atom using particle accelerators. In World War II, another student, Australian Marcus Oliphant, took the nuclear secrets to America and inspired the Yanks to commence the Manhattan Project that ended the war with the explosion of two nuclear weapons. After the death of her radiation-weakened husband in 1906, Marie Curie worked tirelessly living in poverty, bringing up three daughters and continuing her work. 
She ended up with two Nobel Prizes, one for physics and one for chemistry. In spite of this, she had a terrible time. Powerful press barons hated her as a foreign Polish woman who practised her demon science. At one time a mob appeared at the house, pelted her young family with rocks and tried to run her out of the country. In war she established a fleet of 20 portable X-ray vans and led them to the front line together with her daughter Irene. They were much needed as the French wounded were riddled with shrapnel. She became the French Florence Nightingale. Her selfless work in pioneering diagnostic and therapeutic radiation had a profound effect on this country. X-ray machines were vital in the diagnosis of tuberculosis that infected half of the population in World War I. Few of us will not need diagnostic radiation techniques or cancer therapy at some time during our lives. Sir Ernest Marsden in 1914 was appointed physics professor at the University of New Zealand. In 1915 he joined the New Zealand Expeditionary Force and served on the Western Front with the Royal Engineers. He was awarded the Military Cross for Valour under fire. Returning to New Zealand, Ernie worked first in education, then set up the New Zealand version of the CSIRO, with a focus on agricultural research. In the war he did significant radar and finally nuclear research. He was New Zealand's principal scientist. The fate of the young Henry Moseley was the most unfortunate. He joined the Royal Engineers in 1914. On the 25th of April 1915, the Anzacs stormed ashore at Gallipoli and were quickly pinned down on the treacherous slopes of Anzac Cove. Moseley's division landed further round at Suvla Bay. In August 10, he was shot through the head by a Turkish sniper. So ended the life of a brilliant young man who should have received the Nobel Prize. Like the Australian Howard Florey, he remains one of humanity's unknown heroes. The Pilgrim scientists continue their quest to understand what is and to make the world a better and happier place. The way is often hard. Yeah.